The Excelsior class is one of the most prolific ships in Star Trek history. It's appeared over 50 times as different ships across the movies, TNG, DS9, Voyager, and even Enterprise for a brief moment. In this video, we'll take a look at the ship's background, as well as its numerous visual tweaks over the years. We'll go over a lot of other random trivia and observations too with this deep dive into the Excelsior class. If you like the video, there's plenty more like it on the channel. Feel free to rub that subscribe button. Go to hell. Okay, suit yourself. This is the Excelsior class retrospective. Before we're even told its name, the ship is simply referred to as the Great Experiment. My friends, the Great Experiment, the Excelsior. The Great Experiment is probably referring to it having transwarp drive. We're never given an explanation of how it works, but it doesn't really matter. It's just a quick and easy way to imply that it's faster than the Enterprise. Stand by transwarp drive. All speeds available through transwarp drive. Transwarp at your command, sir. Either way, it's fast, and it's what the Borg used to get around so quickly. The Borg have established several transwarp conduits through subspace. So I guess it's a good thing that the transwarp drive experiment failed for the Federation. I don't think Kirk era Starfleet would have been equipped for the Borg. And this doesn't really have anything to do with anything, but the same, the Great Experiment, is used again later, or earlier, however you want to look at it, on Enterprise. It's used in reference to the first extrasolar human colonization on Terra Nova. It was called the Great Experiment. Could humans colonize deep space? That's where all the colonists died of radiation exposure, and their kids survived by living underground and wearing mud on their faces. Even though the Excelsior class is introduced in Star Trek III, Drafts of Star Trek II script made mention of the ship. It would have occurred in the scene where Sulu is piloting Kirk to the Enterprise before they embark on their training mission. I'm counting out Excelsior. Now let's touch upon the prototype study models. The initial thought was to make the ship flat and possibly have four nacelles, like this one featured here. Here's another study model with a similar design and a paper cup. These models did appear briefly on TNG in the Starship Junkyard in the episode Unification 2. Excelsior is also the first time we see the NX designation with NX-2000. That would come up again many more times with the NX-01, Franklin, Dauntless, and Defiant. And the Excelsior also gives us a glimpse at 23rd Century Nail Files, though we've already seen future Nail Files on the original series. So there's some trivia you can file away. That's not very damn funny. Now let's hit up the Excelsior filming model. The first and primary model of the ship would be this. It's seven and a half feet, which to put in perspective is about one Andre the Giant. Oh my God, that's a big ship. During Star Trek III, we only see a few angles of the ship. Its mounting point is on the side if you care to know. It wouldn't be until a couple years later when production pictures appeared that we'd get a closer look at other angles of the ship, namely the bridge, which is a relatively large silver dome compared to what we've seen on the Enterprise and Reliant. This jives with the bridge interior that appears in the movie, which again is much larger than what we've seen on other ships. One quarter impulse bump. May I remind you that regulations specify thrusters only while in space dock? and this original configuration of the model makes its final appearances on TNG. In 1991, the model would be refit for its use in Star Trek VI. When we see the ship in actual service, it's sporting several updates. First off, the registry number is now NCC-2000. The bridge dome is now a traditional one that aligns with other Federation ships, which means it's smaller and corresponds with the smaller bridge interior set that we see in the movie. Around the bridge dome, the arch encircling it has been updated as well. It's mostly a repaint, but a noticeable physical change was it having these two tiny domes on it instead of this single large one from the original. In the aft, the shuttle bay has also been updated. We don't see it in the movie, but I figured I'd just mention it anyway. We see a few interior locations of the ship like Sulu's quarters, which have these Starfleet panels next to his bed because Starfleet really likes putting those things on everything. On the bridge, the forward consoles are a reuse of those from the Enterprise D battle bridge. Up front, we get a glimpse of the dedication plaque next to the view screen, which itself is the same one used for the Enterprise A later in the movie, only slightly modified. The final use of this iteration of the ship was in the first episode of DS9. 
Following that, it received an extensive refit for its use as the Enterprise B in Generations. What I find interesting about this refit of the ship is that it's an actual refit of the model itself in real life, as well as within the context of the movie. Whereas the Constitution refit is a completely new model, the Excelsior refit permanently altered the original filming model. The area around the bridge received a repaint and a very slight redesign. On the sides, there are two huge impulse exhausts, which maybe makes it go faster, I don't know, who cares. Though the clear updates are these flares around the secondary hull, which may serve as a precursor to a similar design on the Enterprise D. These actually play a role in the story, because it's where the Nexus lacerates the ship and sucks Captain Kirk in. Had the original version of the ship been used without these, the Nexus would have missed the ship and Kirk would have avoided the Nexus. If that happened, Picard wouldn't have had a buddy to help him jostle with Sorn at the end of Generations. Picard would have probably failed to defeat him again and again, resulting in a causality loop where the end of Generations would repeat endlessly. Or Picard could have stayed in his Christmas Carol fantasy. Haven't you got anything better to do? Who knows? Speaking of the Nexus, not all the shots of the Enterprise B used the refit model. Shots where the Nexus interacts with the ship is a CG model. This made it easier to create shots where the Nexus interacts with the ship, and also to have its orange color reflected on the hull. This isn't something they could have done easily with traditional miniature filming. On the Enterprise B's neck, we see these two doors. They look like torpedo launchers, but we see shuttles going through them. So you can add that to the gray walnut in your skull. This version of the model would make its final appearance as the USS Lakota on DS9. This would also be the final on-screen appearance of the original 7.5 foot model. The next time we see the Excelsior class prominently featured is in the Voyager episode flashback. This time it's a completely new model of the ship. The reason being that it was too difficult or even impossible to remove the refit add-ons of the original 7.5 foot model from Generations. Though it was probably easier for the TV effects house to use a smaller model as well. This one was about 3 feet, which is about one Andre the Giant. Boot. The model is a faithful recreation of the original, though this time the warp nacelle coils glow blue. The significant changes made to this iteration of the ship can be found on the interior. So if you're still watching the video, you must care about a lot of stuff that no one should really care about. So here's a bunch of meaningless differences between the Excelsior from Star Trek VI and the one from Voyager. The captain's chair is slightly different. It's most evident from the height of the headrest. And the color is also slightly different. I don't care what color the headrest is. The forward consoles are also different. And come to think of it, the helmsman is also different. These guys don't look anything alike. And I like how on Voyager they just use these office chairs. The screen looks similar, but it's a new piece. On the sides, the Voyager version doesn't have these mini seats by the turbo lift doors. And given how Janeway walks through the doors, it doesn't even look like a turbo lift. Had Tuvok appeared on screen in Star Trek VI, he would have been sitting here. Oh, and we see something that's used on all Starfleet ships, though it's only barely there. Rocks. This model would appear a final time with some battle damage on DS9 Season 6 premiere. So, where are the Excelsior class models now? According to Memory Alpha, the original 7.5 footer was sold to a European group by the name of Science Fiction Archives. As for the smaller 3.5 foot model, that one is currently owned by an avid Star Trek model collector, Adam Snyder. He also owns the Ambassador and Sovereign class models. Excelsior, why in God's name would you want that bucket of bolts? And to close things out, the Excelsior class would make one final on-screen appearance. It's on Enterprise when Archer is scanning through some schematics they found on a 31st century holographic device. It appears on screen for about an eighth of a second, which I actually measured because I thought that sort of thing might be interesting, which it isn't. So that wraps it up. This channel recently surpassed 50,000 subscribers. That may not be much for some channels, but 50,000 is more than I thought this channel would ever have. 
So from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that made that possible. That's all I got for this one. Thanks for watching you 23rd Century Nail Files, and I'll catch you in the next video.